I'm Bill Trainer, and it's a priv privilege and a pleasure to welcome you to the first class of Lawyers as Leaders. Uh, since we started to think about this course in March, excitement has been growing incredibly. I think every time I talk to a student or an alum or somebody from another law school about it, I always get the same question. Can I sign up for that course? And remarkably, even though we're offering it on a weekend, 340 of you are signed up. So I can't wait to start and I can't wait to have our very first guest, Professor Larry Gostin of the Georgetown Law Faculty. Um, the genesis of this course grew out of discussions with Dean Hillary Sale. And so I'd like to begin by thanking her for conceptualizing this course and, and doing so much to help put it together. Um, you know, I think all of you have probably heard me talk about the great advantage or one of the great advantages of Georgetown Law is that we're in Washington, D.C., that we have the D.C. advantage. It means that you have a kind of educational opportunity, that you have a series of career opportunities that you wouldn't get elsewhere. And since the pandemic started in March, I and the faculty and the staff have been very focused on how do we make the DC advantage? How do we bring it to a, to a pandemic virtual environment? And so we have a lot of different initiatives and this is one of them. Uh, it's one that focuses in on our faculty. So we have, as you know, an extraordinary faculty. So many people come to Georgetown Law because at Georgetown, in Washington, D.C., they have an opportunity to, to shape the dialogue, the national dialogue, the international dialogue, and to make change in a way that they wouldn't anywhere else. And, you know, I'm aware of that when I talk to them. I'm aware of it every time I turn on the TV or look at the newspaper, the way in which our faculty is really shaping the dialogue about the major issues in the day. So this is an opportunity for our faculty to share their life stories, to reflect on their achievements and their struggles through an unconventional platform. Um, now, I have to say, you know, at the very start, you know, as I was reflecting on it this morning, this is an unconventional class, not just because it's a virtual class, but because of its subject. Normally in a law school class, faculty is teaching you about a specific subject. It's teaching you about contracts or constitutional law or appellate litigation or criminal procedure. The focus is always on an area of the law. This, however, is a different kind of class. It's a class where faculty are not focused on a specific area of the law, but on their careers, what they've hoped to achieve, what they've done and failed to do, and what they've learned along the way. And through your questions and through your reflection paper, you'll be part of that dialogue with them. And it's really, it, it's amazing to me, again, as I, was, as I was thinking about my opening, I was reflecting on what an amazing group of faculty you're gonna be hearing from this semester. We're gonna be starting with Larry Gostin and Professor Gostin will be discussing the great coronavirus pandemic. You'll then hear from Neil Katyal, who will be talking about the Guantanamo litigation and his epic Supreme Court argument in Hamdan. Paul Butler will talk about his book, Chokehold, Policing Black Men. And he'll be asking the question, lawyers are good at getting reform, but what about when reform is not enough? Vic Nurse, who worked as Vice President Biden's counsel, will reflect on the life of the legal nerd from the Senate to the White House. Randy Barnett, who has so profoundly shaped constitutional law, will talk about the relevance of anti-slavery constitutionalism for modern constitutional law. Rosa Brooks will talk about preparing for the presidential election and potential transition disruptions. Professor Peter Edelman, who's been an important voice in national politics since he was a top aide for Bobby Kennedy, 
we'll talk about the election. And we'll close with Professor Chris Henning. We'll talk about her work at Georgetown and nationally, focusing on the subject, policing race and adolescence. It's an extraordinary group, diverse in their politics, diverse in their areas of expertise. And one of my goals in the course is to show that even if we don't agree, even when we don't agree, we can learn from each other. So now in terms of kind of my larger goals for the course, what our educational outcomes should be, I look forward to our learning how leaders fix goals and create building blocks towards achievements. How the interplay between law and norms shapes our leadership goals. How our leadership choices and ethical values can impact the lives of others in big and small ways. And I hope you'll also get from the course that we should strive to treat everyone, not just our professional peers, but we should try to treat everyone justly and fairly as we conduct ourselves in our careers. And the ultimate aim for this course is to prompt you to reflect and form your own career arcs and decisions. So, I, you know, I don't know any other course like this one, and I can't wait to begin. A uh, few, few housekeeping matters. I'd like to thank Professor Larry Gostin uh, for being our first speaker. I'd like to thank Dean Sale for coming up with the idea of the course and working so hard to make it a reality. Um, Kelsey Levin Epstein has done an amazing job in helping organize the course. Uh, the first TAs, the TAs who helped put together this session, Jessica Kelly and Jacob Eigner, have done a terrific job. And every week, we're going to have two of our TAs, and we have 13 great TAs for this course. They'll help organize the class and the questions. And again, I want to thank uh, Jessica and Jacob for doing a wonderful job on the first class. I'd like to thank all of you for submitting so many insightful questions. I reviewed them for this class and I was just so impressed with the thought that's gone into them. A um, couple of reminders. Uh, remember to submit your two questions to the Canvas discussions every Thursday or before 11.59 Eastern time. So two questions every week. We won't be having a class next week, but the following week, Thursday before it, two questions by 11.59 Eastern time. Um, I'm gonna be using the questions that we've got uh, in my dialogue with Professor Gostin, but we're also gonna be taking live questions. So I urge you to submit questions during the, uh, the session using the Q&A feature of Zoom. Uh, and I'd also like to remind you that your TAs are here to support you through the process, to help you engage with the materials, to prepare questions, to provide feedback on the final reflection paper and any other concerns you have. So now let's start. Uh, let me introduce Professor Larry Gostin. I'm gonna call him on in a minute, but let me just say, actually, there he is. Welcome, Professor Gostin. It's terrific to see I, you. I, I have my trigger hand too quick. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to see you. And I just wanna say, both Professor Gostin and I are wearing jackets today, which is the first time I think We've both been doing that for about six months, but it's great to see you here doing this course. Um, let me just talk a little bit about Professor Gostin. Uh, he's a university professor, and he's the founding O'Neill Chair in Global Health Law at Georgetown. Uh, he currently serves as the faculty director for the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law. And he has been the leading voice on the role of law in responding to the pandemic. So in preparing for this session, uh, I, you know, I gave you some of his recent scholarship. Uh, you know, he's amazingly prolific. Actually, I was saying to Professor Gostin in our prep session that I think in the last six months, he's written more than I've read. Uh, it's amazing how much he's able to write and how influential and his important his scholarship is. And his work is not just as a scholar, but through international organizations, through talking to government leaders, and through being a public commentator. So, uh, you know, I just uh, uh, did a Google search this morning and he's really, he's omnipresent. So he's been in the Times and the Post and on Fox and MSNBC and CNN, 
he's everywhere. So he has done such a major part of our thinking through how we respond to this crisis. Um, a little bit about some of his other roles. He directs the World Health Organization Center on National and Global Health Law. He came to Georgetown in 1994. And in addition to his appointment at the law school, he has, he's a professor of medicine at our medical school and is a professor of public health at Johns Hopkins. Uh, the WHO Director General appointed Professor Gostin to several high-level positions, including expert panels on the international health regulation and on mental health. He served on the Director General's Advisory Committee on Reforming WHO, as well as on WHO Expert Advisory Committees on Influenza, Smallpox, genoma sequen Genomic Sequencing, and Migrant Health. He also serves on the WHO's Blue Ribbon Panel on Global Health Equity, and co-chairs the Lancet Commission of Global Health Law. It's really an extraordinary background and we're so privileged to have him at Georgetown. Um, in addition to helping shape the national and international response to the pandemic, he's also been somebody who has helped us, you know, think through our response at Georgetown. And since the crisis started to emerge early in this year, we have been in constant conversation and I'm so much in his debt for helping us think through, you know, how to respond at Georgetown to the pandemic. So welcome, Professor Gostin, and, and thank you very much for, uh, for joining us here today. Well, thank you. Um, I've, I just wanted to say my own, you know, short remarks of thanks as well. I mean, I've, you know, I've been at Georgetown Law for a long time, and there's just no place like it on earth. I've been to you know, every continent and uh, to so many universities. And this place is really special. And, and I hope you um, can see it the way I do. Um, I've also, you know, got to know uh, Dean Trainer and Dean Sale um, even more than I did before uh, during this pandemic. And what the pandemic really showed, um, I think, uh, both uh, at university levels, community levels, uh, nationally and globally, is that, you know, leadership shows it either fails or it shines. And, and in the case of Dean Trainer and Dean Sale, it's really shined in, in ways that are just uh, stunningly impressive. Um, I also wanted to thank um, Kelsey, uh, Jake, and Jessica, and also to all of you, because I know this is a really hard time being in a pandemic and we're all getting used to a new environment where we're doing things remotely and to be able to kind of, you know, do that in, 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 in ways that, you know, keep our humaneness and our socialization is really, really hard. So I just wanted to begin by thanking you and particularly Dean Trainer. Well, thank you. You know, I think, um, you know, we're all in your debt. And I think, you know, one of the things that has been very important to me is what you just highlighted, that, you know, in this very challenging time, focusing in on humanity and what we do as people, and that that's really been a guide. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why we have this course. You know, I mean, we're really kind of stepping out of our normal role as academics, you know, rather than focusing in on a subject, you know, we're thinking through you know, what, what we do and what our students can do, you know, in their careers and as people. So that's why I think this is really going to be a very important conversation. So, um, so let me just step back. So would you talk a little bit, Professor Gostin, about your role with Georgetown Law? Sure. Well, you know, um, partly I'm just, I'm a garden variety professor. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, I teach, I, I um, I direct the O'Neill Institute. Um, one of the things that, you know, I do, and I'm finding it much more so as, as I'm getting on in my career, um, you know, the community of students means more to me than anything. And I want to, I want to give back to the students because they've given so much to me. So certainly with our Global Health LLM class or our uh, or the O'Neill Institute itself, um, we, uh, you know, we pride ourselves in being a family. Um, before, this will be the first time 
ever that I haven't had everybody, including the Global Health LLMs and, uh, and uh, the O'Neill Institute uh, to my home. We always come, we, we have a six mile walk to Great Falls National Park and then come back and get a healthy brunch. You know, a lot of it I make. And, um, you know, I miss that terribly. Um, but, you know, student well-being, um, student health is becoming more and more important to me um, as, you know, as I think about how I can give back to this incredible community. So, I mean, that's a very good point. Are there certain things that you would, as, you know, as we're starting to advise students, that you would have them think about in terms of their health and well-being? Yeah, I mean, I was thinking we we're going to get into that later, but I mean, it's always, it's actually a good place to start. My, my, my dad uh, was, um, he died at 102 and he, when he, at his funeral, something like 20 grand, great grandchildren that he had all thought that they were the most special. But he, he would say, uh, when he took them to a museum, the very first thing he would do is go to the cafe get a cup of tea or coffee and a piece of cake. And he said, well, we should really start with that because isn't that what we're really for, here for? And then he would just go, then he would go to the, the uh, exhibit. So what's our piece of cake? Unfortunately, it's not cake. <laughs> um, it's you know, something a lot healthier than that. But um, I think uh, if the important thing in, in all of your lives, I would think, is first, you know, maintain your own mental and physical health. Um, you don't do it to live long, you do it to live well and happy and vigorously. Um, and you, and it, so you don't, you, you do that not by, you know, going on a diet, but living your life in a way that's conducive to that. Um, because when you're physically healthy and mentally healthy, you can give so much, you can give to your family, your community, um, your job um, and, and your world. Um, and so I think that you know, living a good life to me um, is being healthy, caring about the health and the well-being of the people that are around you, um, and then making some difference in the world according to what your passions and your values are. Um, but it's always, it is part of the Jesuit spirit. I, I do believe it very, very strongly is, is that, you know, whatever, whatever way you want to contribute, it's really important to make that contribution and career. Um, yes, of course, with your career, you want to, you want to succeed. You want to succeed among your peers. You want, your family and your community to be proud of you. Those are all important things. But careers are really more instrumental. They're there to help you do good in the world in your way. Um, and so when you focus on careers, remember that. Um, and also remember, you know, the importance of, you know, what, what you want to do. For me, it's been health and justice, which is something that uh, Dean Trainer and I think we're, are going to be um, talking about. But those are the things that are important. And maybe later on, we can drill down and talk a little bit more about, you know, what does it take to lead a healthy life? Uh, one of the, 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 the greatest joys I have at Georgetown is, is, if I may, called the Dean Bill. Bill and I would, you know, go to lunch and we just kind of talk about life and health and family. And it's just, it's, it's lovely. And, and hope, I hope to, today we can replicate a little bit of that. that that's our goal. That's yeah. our goal. I hope we can. And so we'll go back and, and talk about kind of the larger framework of, yeah. you know, your thoughts on, you know, people's life choices and what their goals are. But, but let me go back. So how did you get interested in law? What made you decide law as a career? You know, it's, it was a really long, um, it was a long process. At university, I wanted to um, go into experimental psychology. Um, and then, you know, uh, I'm old enough so that the, um, you know, Vietnam protests were on when I was at university. And in particular, I was one of the student leaders of uh, kind of the racial justice aspect of that. And there was... It's not 
historically mentioned much, but there was, you know, quite a lot of, um, uh, 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 you know, separate and combined protests uh, that uh, had to do with um, racial justice. And then I realized that, you know, the way I could make a difference in the world was to go into law. Um, and then I had, I remember out of law school, I had three job offers. Um, one was, you know, New York Legal Aid. Um, the other was a Wall Street, you know, white, white shoe firm. Um, and the third was a, um, a Fulbright and Marshall and Rhodes scholarship to, to uh, the United Kingdom. I decided to go to the UK. Um, and that was, you know, I spent the next 15 years there. My kids were born there. My wife is um, from England. Um, and I had a whole, I have a whole nother life there. Um, for example, I, you know, I was the head of the National Association for Mental Health there. Most people don't know that that was my first love was mental health. I was actually the head of um, the British ACLU, um, which is called the National Council of Civil, Li Civil Liberties. I led the independent inquiry into the miners dispute, which is the greatest social disruption in modern history in the UK and probably Europe. Um, so it was a very formative um, time of my life before I came back to the United States and really didn't start in kind of you know public and global health and uh, until I until I returned to the U.S. So let me go back. So what made you? So you have three very different career paths coming out of law school. Yeah. Why did you go to the U.S. U.K. What what made you decide that that was the path for you? Um, well, you know, when you're when you're young and you're just out of law school, you don't you know you have to just. Go, for me, I just went with my heart. I was. I yearned adventure and I wanted to go out and make my way in the world. And so um, I really did want to go to the New York Legal Aid because you know, that was very much part of my heart. I, was, I only applied for the Wall Street firm because all my colleagues were doing it. So I never really considered wanting to do that. I've never been mo motivated by money, still not. Um, and then, um, just, you know, going to the UK. I mean, I just remember, you know, getting there and just my eyes popping out of my head. And um, I, you know, living in other countries for me, and I've lived in several, not as, not as long as I did in the UK, but in several, um, is really, um, was very expanding for me and eye-opening and to kind of lead major you know, nonprofits in, in, in the UK, um, you know, is great. I, you know, I ended up, you know, going to Downing Street, you know, having tussles and things with Margaret Thatcher and, and on my board at the, the National Council of Civil Liberties. These are net names you would know here in the United States, but they're all household names, you know, um, Tony Wedgwood, Ben, um, Neil Kinnock, um, uh, the head of miners, um, uh, the head of the miners uh, union, things like that. I mean, it was really, uh, you know, for an American to be exposed to all that was something that was incredible. And I, I, I think I'm not sure, Bill, whether you sent this around, but I wrote my autobiography called "From a Civil Libertarian to a Sanitarian" about my journey from you know civil liberties um, all the way through um, to a sanitarians and basically it's you know I used to ask the question you know what what um, you know as a rights bearing person you know what what does government and and everyone owe me and now I ask another kind of question and I ask others to ask this question you know what do I owe to my community to my family to my country to my world um, to 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 achieve the common good and 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 uh, you know the collective public goods, those to me, it's kind of you know missing in much of America when we're so focused on I, 
and we're not really thinking about you know community and 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 our social embeddedness with one another it's really very important so what what caused the change so i mean i, I guess you know as you go through your career path you know the two things that really hit me one is that you've consistently chosen what's really the path less traveled right? yeah so mental health then aids then public health now global health you know that consistently you've set out on a path who's haven't been following and then you know this shift from focusing on civil liberties to focus on the common good. What, what, was that a shift? What led to it? It was a shift. I mean, first of all, you're right. Um, I did, um, you, you know, I've always believed in the, the path less traveled. You know, there's, you know, there's so many people in my field, for example, that look at, you know, they're important questions, but they're, to me, they're small questions. You know, the doctor-patient relationship, informed consent, uh, things like that, um, or even, you know, uh, new technologies like, you know, at the time surrogacy or genetic sequencing now. You know, I, so I like to think of big problems that affect the world, but I also don't want to be in a field that everyone else is in. And so I started in mental health. There were very, very few people. I went, my very first formative experience was being a um, uh, as part of a Justice Department study, an, an, an inmate uh, in a hospital for the criminally insane. Mm. Um, that was really, uh, you know, life changing. It still is. I could explain why. Um, and yeah. actually, let me just stop you. What, would you explain why? Talk about yeah, that. I mean, I think unless you've unless you've experienced the the sheer terror. Um, and the sheer deprivation of being in, you know, what was called a total institution, um, where you you had, you know, nobody saw you, you were you were feared, every, you were you were in fear, where you had you, you know, there would there's no toilets, toilet paper, you know, the things in life, and you know, I ended up. Um, just looking out the window, like as if I were a mental patient, just shaking like this. Hmm. Um, and uh, now, you know, I can go into any institution. So, for example, you know, subsequently I led the National Academy of Sciences uh, Expert uh, Commission on um, on uh, prison health. Well, I can go into a prison or a mental hospital or a nursing home and actually notice things and see things that people, other people can't, you know, you know, that, you know, that, that you, you can just see the deprivation or you can see a good place. Some, some places are good, but I think it was to, to, to experience that. Um, and also not even knowing if I would get out because I wasn't supposed to say that, you know, I was supposed to be um, at, in the institution uh, being assessed for my competency for an alleged rape. Um, and I found out that the only way I could get out was literally finally saying that oh, I was mentally ill and I, and I did do the rape, even though I was neither. Um, so it's just, you know, it's just, you know, the, the, um, I, w I would maybe, um, put it back to something that you're gonna discuss later on with um, Chris Henning and Paul Butler and others. But the, the, um, when I was at Harvard, there was a, I, I taught the very first course in the world with, on health and human rights with Jonathan Mann. Now, none of you will know Jonathan Mann. He died in the Swiss air disaster many, many years ago. And actually his, his daughters went to Georgetown, one went to the law school. Um, he, he, um, he had this, um, you know, uh, theory um, before he died. He was he was hugely respected, that the founder of the health and human rights movement, um, about dignity violations. And we do these, you know, um, uh, do these um, experiments with students. And if somebody, I mean, the the down the upside is is that if, you know. If you ask 
if I asked you all your students now, let's just, I'll just pretend to do it now. So close your eyes um, and think about, you know, one of the times in your life when you were, you, you felt absolutely affronted and uh, confronted with, you know, something that really undermines your, your dignity. Um, and then uh, we then have a conversation about it and these students would just be crying, you know, it really brings a vis visceral feeling out. But then you remind them of how most of them have been very, very fortunate all their lives. What about somebody who wakes up every day from their childhood through adulthood and they, have, they suffer compound dignity violations? It's all part of their lives. Kind of makes you think how you know, critically important um, it is to be good to other people and to have other people be good to you. Um, you know, so, so if you want to do well in your life, I mean, you, there might be just two simple things I might say, you know, one is be good to everyone, you know, not just people who, you know, you think of your, as your equal or your superior, but be good to everyone. Um, and then the other is, and this will go far, it's just smile. <laughs> Um, you know, when you, when you're not just, you know, if you're in a job interview or you're with a friend or you're having a coffee, smiling goes a long way. So how did, are these life lessons, how did you derive them? Is it from your upbringing? Was it from your life experience afterwards? You know, I, I don't know. I had a very, um, I did have a very, very hard upbringing. Um, I've never, I don't talk about it. It's the first time anybody's asked, but my mother, you know, um, became uh, terminally ill uh, when I was five years old. And it took, you know, about, uh, you know, 10 to 15 years of agonizing death, you know, and as a small child be having to try to cope with that. And I won't give, you know, lurid details. And we were, you know, very, very poor, um, uh, very, very poor uh, growing up. And I was depressed. I mean, my, my, um, my cousin, my older cousin, who's now a doctor, he used to come and tutor me and he would just say to my dad, you know, sorry, it's just not college material. <laughs> and and uh, I was depressed and it wasn't until I left home that I was able to kind of uh, be, you know, uh, and sparky and, 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 and get that kind of enthusiasm for life, which I still have. And I've lived a very, very privileged life and, and, uh, I just couldn't couldn't have ever imagined, um, you know, how happy and 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 fortunate I've become in my life. So I'm sorry that you know you had such struggles and such loss growing up. I mean, up. many people have. You know, it's I'm not special, but many people have. And then, um, and I have to say, I'm always struck by your optimism. Yeah. You know, it's. Um, is that something that you developed along the way? Because it really is, it's very striking. Yeah, I mean, I think it, you know, it is, you know, the, the um, you know, it's good, it's good to be optimistic. It's good to, you know, think that good things can happen and that you can play your, your part um, in what happens. Um, I also, Bill, never really did answer your question about how I moved from a civil libertarian to a sanitary and I think it's because you know I still believe in civil liberties of course passionately so um, but I also believe that um, you know we've got a neglected tradition particularly in the United States and it's come out with COVID-19 a tradition that is truly um, individualistic you know the rugged individualism um, that we have in the United States that we, you know, and it's, it means that we often are unwilling to do things for others. You know, you can think about, the, you know, small things like mask use um, or social distancing. Um, we're just so, everything is about my rights. Um, and sometimes you do need rights and you have to have rights and particularly rights to justice and anti-discrimination. Those are really, really important. Um, but it's also important, I think, to, to, to have you know, 
community good, the common good. And so I think as I grew up um, and I fought for the rights of the mentally ill in, in the UK, I brought, you know, it was one of my formative, formative experiences as I brought, you know, what are now the, the really big kind of Roe v. Wade cases uh, at the European Court of Human Rights, but I did it in mental health. Um, but if you see people suffer, um, you realize that we need to create, we need to create the common good. And so public health, safety, security, well-being um, have become, you know, much growing part of my way I think about life. Was there a moment when you realized that your focus was shifting and that you were going to be focusing, moving forward more on the common good and you know, you know, there, you know, there wasn't a moment, you know, I mean, the thing is about, you know, about a life or a career, um, it's, it's often not about, you know, all of the, um, uh, you know, conscious choices or kind of, oh, this pivotal movement, I went from there. You know, I, I, I went from um, the National Association for Mental Health in the UK um, uh, through to the um, National Council of Civil Liberties, with two very, very formative experiences. And I went to Oxford University. Um, and then I, I was recruited back um, to the United States to go to Harvard. And I worked on the early days of the AIDS epidemic, um, which was equally formative. And then I went from AIDS more to public health, you know, things like, you know, diabetes, heart disease, injuries, um, things like that. Um, infectious diseases more generally, and then, you know, moved more to global health. I just keep, um, you know, having an expansion. I don't, I think this has got to be the, the last one. I think global health will be it. <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, so global health and justice, I think, is going to be my, fi my final. <laughs> I I think it's good good for you to be focused on that now. So thank you. Uh, yeah, it's fortunate to be to doing that. I actually that's part of the the great fortune I've had. You know, like during AIDS, I was I was working on AIDS when it exploded as a pandemic, or you know, in mental health when people were really really starting to wake up about the civil rights of of the mentally ill. I was you know already in the field, and now you know. You know, my wife has said, you know, tongue in cheek, you know, she said, you know, Larry, you, you now have the, the pandemic you've always wanted. <laughs> so I guess I've been preparing for this my whole life. <laughs> but I don't want this pandemic, believe me, it's horrible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, you know, but you really are doing so much to kind of help us confront it and think about it. So let me just kind of ask kind of at a larger level, and I, I want to talk about the pandemic and responses to it, because I thought, you know, you're, one of the things that you were, you're focusing on that was really interesting is the way in which kind of our culture uh, makes it difficult for us to respond effectively to this pandemic. Yeah. But let me just kind of ask, a, I want to get to that, but then just a couple kind of larger theoretical questions. So what do you see as the connection between global health and justice? Yeah, I mean, I've often, you know, a lot of people now talking about, talk about global health justice. And it occurred to me, and I just wrote a long um, article in the Georgetown Law Journal in the current issue about this. You know, for me, I call it global health with justice because you can have global health, and in fact, we do. Um, uh, if you think of, if you define global health as ever uh, advancing indicators of, of human health around the world. And so if you look at that in the last 10 years, this is something that Bill Gates talks about quite a lot. Um, you know, if you look at, you, you really see enormous progress absolute poverty um, is down. And this is all before COVID. COVID's changing a few of these things. But absolute poverty is down. Longevity is skyrocketing in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and other, uh, other parts of the world. Um, if you look at um, uh, uh, maternal mortality or under five deaths, also um, we're doing well. Malaria, TB, AIDS, um, uh, you've got uh, enormous uh, progress being made. 
Um, we, we're on, we've, we've eradicated smallpox. We're on the verge of eradicating um, polio. Um, the last case of wild polio in Africa was just, um, uh, uh, it was declared over in Africa just a week or two ago. So we've made enormous progress. So we are doing, you know, indicators of global health are really strong. Um, but, it, but the goods of health are not equally distributed. Um, and so you have global health, but without justice. And in my view, even before COVID, but much, much more since, the, the prevailing global narrative is one of injustice, inequity, um, inequality. I think that's been really obvious that people are looking around and they're saying, uh, look, you know, just the few have so much, so much, so many riches, so many opportunities in life, so many chances to be healthy and happy and, and, and secure in their finances. Um, why not me? You know, and the whole idea of being left behind has become a global grievance. Um, and I think it's driving almost everything. Uh, it's, it's amplified with COVID. And I think that the um, protests against uh, racial injustice and police violence um, are part of that global narrative. And I don't think that um, the COVID pandemic and these protests are unrelated. I think that they're absolutely related. You know, and Martin Luther King um, said, you know, it's one of his most a remarkable statements among many that, you know, all injustice is unconscionable, but health injustice is the most unconscionable. You know, so what your mom told you, you know, you, if you've got your health, you've got everything, um, has a strong element of truth to it. And when so many people have this potential for, you know, good health and so many don't, um, whether it's you know disparities by race or socioeconomic status and you know cancer, diabetes, AIDS, tuberculosis, or now COVID, um, that's really truly unjust and something that I don't think that we can tolerate um, much longer. And so I do think that that is um, you know crucial. So you need global health and justice. You know you can also have justice without global health. You could have you know, a, a, a flat curve equally distributed or, or equitably distributed health, but at a low level. You really want both. You, you have to fight both for ever advancing uh, outcomes in health, but also um, uh, equitable, fair distribution. This is going to become a huge issue with vaccines, for example. You know, our own country is the worst violator, but we're not the only one. Even Canada, China, um, the UK, other parts of Europe, are, we're now buying out all the stocks of vaccines with advanced purchases. And in the United States case, we're um, not joining um, the World Health Organization-led COVAX, which is intended to um, uh, equitably distribute uh, vaccines around the world. So you could imagine what will happen if, you know, people are dying in their tens of millions in sub-Saharan Africa or Middle East. People in Europe and the United States and China are healthy. Um, the, the sense of injustice, the outrage, I think will, will, will be, you know, pouring over and um, we're doing nothing about it and we're thinking about nothing about it, you know, other than our own population. I think this is a disaster that, you know, we're going to have to confront. So what's, the, and actually one of the very common student questions was about this. So how should the vaccine be allocated? Yeah, I mean, the, the vaccine should be allocated in any given country like the United States, you know, based upon need and the potential for good. So at the, fir the first uh, use of the vaccine would be twofold. I mean, I think one would be, you know, essential workers, you know, people that, you know, keep our, keep our community working, um, health workers, 
um, essential workers, sanitation, um, firefighters, others that really kind of, we need to keep our society functioning. Um, the other um, is a public health function. That is, you know, sometimes you, you know, if you've got a, a cluster of, of infections, you might want to do a ring vaccine. That's what we did very successfully, for example, in uh, Ebola, um, to try to put a ring around these kinds of clusters. And we do that with measles and other, other, other vaccine preventable diseases. Okay. But the, what is yeah. you talk about what a ring what that means? Yeah, it just means that you know, let's say you've got a an outbreak, a cluster of cases. So let let's say we we got COVID nineteen under control, um, and we get it under control, and we're able to um, uh, then do what we should have done right at the beginning is is really get very aggressive with it. If you act early and aggressively, it seems to be the only formula that works. And so you'd have to have a very, very strong um, program of surveillance and other um, testing um, so that you could identify cases and also identify outbreaks as they come. So as soon as you get an outbreak or a cluster, you, you vaccinate everybody in that cluster and the geographic ring around uh, the, uh, the outbreak to prevent it from, being, from, from spreading. Um, so if you, you know, an analogy might be, you know, if you're, if you've got floodwaters and you build a barrier, you know, so you, to, to contain it. And that's, you know, that's what a ring vaccination is. So, so within the United States, we should prioritize. Yeah, that, and then the next would be based upon need. Yes. Yeah, so it would be essential workers, public health, essential vital functions like ring vaccination. And then it's, you know, people who need it most, um, the vulnerable, um, the elderly, people with uh, pre-existing conditions. There's a lot of discussion about whether we should give preference um, to, to groups that have suffered disproportionately, um, you know, based upon you know, race, African-Americans or, you know, or, or um, Native Americans. Uh, and so I think, based upon need would be for would be next um and then after that you slowly roll it out to a wider population unfortunately i think it's going to be exactly the opposite of all that because i think you know the the you know the well-off will absolutely have um uh access to this vaccine first and foremost now bill you're not going to believe this but i'm down to one percent power so i'm going to you might want to just like you can do a tap dance while I go get my I go get my um, plug and put it in. Sorry. I think you know one of the things that you know we're seeing is that there are technological issues with doing virtual classes, um, and I'm just very fortunate that uh, last night my computer crashed, but uh, George Patasis, our CIO, was able to help bring it back. So. So this class is going forward, but I'm very mindful of, of that. Um, and I think, you know, Professor Gostin's discussion, uh, you know, if I can just take a moment to reflect on it, you know, really, you know, embodies the themes of the course. So part of it is, uh, you know, we're talking right now about his area of expertise. And so many of you wrote questions in about the, the pandemic, and I'm gonna talk in a minute about the, uh, the Russian attempts to create a vaccine and how we should work with that. So, you know, we have a kind of a series of different questions about, uh, you know, how we respond to the pandemic, which draw on Professor Gostin's expertise. You know, and then the larger questions that we I'm started. Back. Are you back? Good. <laughs> <laughs> right. So think about people in Africa that don't have reliable electricity or internet connections. <laughs> So I was just saying that, you know, one of the things that, so we're really, there are kind of two themes to today's class. One is your subject area of expertise, and we have a lot of questions about the pandemic and the response to that. And then also your reflections on your career and the choices you've made as, as people are starting their own careers. Yeah. Well, I want to just stay right now on the, the pandemic. Um, and we've talked about within the United States, what about globally? You know, how now should it be allocated to different countries? What's the approach that we should be following? Well, you know, the, the approach should be that everyone should have 
you know, a fair shot at the vaccine. That is, there's no reason why a life in uh, North America or in uh, Europe should count more than a life in, you know, Africa, Asia, or Latin America. Uh, and so I think that uh, WHO at the moment, with with a with has formed an alliance, you know, with um, uh, Gavi, which is which is a, a major NGO on on global vaccines, uh, and um, and others uh, to tr to actually have a formula to just make sure that as vaccines are rolled out, that we have we do two things that we actually ramp up manufacturing and then make sure that it's equitably distributed. You know, and I've often said that, you know, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine, which I, you know, in my whole lifetime, I can't, uh, I can't think of another example of, of a more precious um, medical commodity. Perhaps maybe the salt polio vaccine would be somewhat similar, but this was, this is really, uh, can change lives. It saves, it'll save millions of lives. It'll save our economy. It will be able to get back to, to school, to work, to, to socialize with one another, all the things that we yearn, yearn for. And, and so what we, so it's meaning a global public good means to me um, that no country should hoard it, that no company should profit from it, that no one should hold the intellectual property rights to it, um, and that it's uh, affordable and accessible um, to every, everybody everywhere. Now, I think it's very likely that we will see much more than one vaccine um, coming forward through 2021. And so there's going to be multiple vaccines. Uh, if we can make sure that they're manufactured in, at scale, um, particularly in places like India, which has an enormous uh, vaccine uh, manufacturing capacity and then can deliver it to the rest of the world. I think that's our, our best hope. The United States actually is being very, very foolish because we're, we're making a bet that our vaccines are going to be first and best and if you had to predict right now, um, I wouldn't predict that ours will be first and best. Um, it'll, you know, right now, there are nine um, vaccine candidates in phase three, which is the final placebo-controlled mass uh, clinical trials. You know, of those nine, two, in, two are in the United States. Um, five are in China. Um, so it gives you an idea that that you know we, if we joined Covax and joined the global effort, um, we could have access to other vaccines that come up. But now, if if we act selfishly, and our bet doesn't come out true, that is, we're not first and best, we could easily be at the back of the line. Hmm. Actually, let me just, I'm going to follow up on that. I just want to note, I hope everybody's learning a lot from this class. And I've gotten a lot of student questions in advance that we're going to be talking through. But in addition, if you want to submit live questions, remember to do so on the Q&A Zoom function. So let me go back. Um, the Russian, and let's talk about kind of the different countries focusing on developing their vaccine. Uh, we received several inquiries about efforts by Russia to create a vaccine. Yeah. Uh, how should the United States attempt to prevent a competitive race? And I think this is also what you're talking about that may hamper our ability to develop an effective COVID vaccine. Yeah, you know, well, first let me talk about Russia and then talk about kind of the global competition for a COVID vaccine. Um, you know, the Russian vaccine is highly unethical. Um, it actually only um, was in phase one and early phase two clinical trials when Vladimir Putin um, actually uh, agreed to uh, approve it for general use in the population. Even before that, they used it on their military and even, even um, 
uh, boasted that he experimented, it was his words, on his daughter with the vaccine. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's really um, an affront to science um, to approve something for general use um, before it's proven safe and effective. Vaccines are, you know, they're the greatest public health achievement of the 20th century. They've saved billions of lives around the planet. Um, but they're the only medical intervention that you give to otherwise healthy people. And so you have to be really sure that they're safe and effective. You can only do that through completion of phase three clinical trials. And even after that, um, you need to do post-marketing surveillance to make sure that there aren't any unknown risks when you roll it out at scale to a large population. So very small safety problems can magnify when you put it into a, 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 a large population. So I think you know, the, the Russian vaccine is our nightmare scenario. China has been acted a little bit more responsibly, but it too uh, uh, had a, um, an emergency uh, use authorization for its COVID-19 vaccine to be used by uh, its military and, and minors as well. Um, and that I think was also unethical. And people are always asking me, you know, you know could, could that happen in the United States? Could we, could we circumvent science? So for example, you know, the CDC announced that it would have, that, that, it, that all states should be prepared to distribute a vaccine by early November before the election. Well, that's outrageous. Um, the, and, but I've often said what separates the United States from other countries, particularly Russia, China, and, and others, um, is, is that we have institutional guardrails, uh, in this case, in the form of the FDA. And I know that the FDA has been under enormous pressure politically, and I know that CDC has as well. Um, but but m knowing the FDA as well as I do, knowing CDC as well as I do, I'm, I have high confidence that those agencies will bend, but they won't break. Um, and I, so, I, so I do, do believe what, what FDA center directors have said, and they just put out an op-ed on this, um, that they will not under any circumstances yield to political pressure. And you know, I do believe that, and it would be very sad day in America if that weren't the case. So, but you think the guardrails will hold and that whenever a vaccine is available, it will be safe? Yes. I think, if, I think the FDA, I think and hope <laughs> that the FDA will wait till the conclusion and publication of, of phase three clinical trials of the two main candidates in the United States um, that they will then be v highly transparent in the, in the safety and efficacy data um, so that we can all see it. Um, they've already un undertaken to have uh, an independent advisory committee advise them about um, uh, approving that vaccine. Um, if all of those steps are taken uh, and then it is approved, I do believe that, that it would be safe. Now, how effective it will be is another matter. I mean, I'd, I'd I, I'm not highly confident that we're going to have a vaccine that's the magic bullet. Um, it's very possible it could be like a, an influenza vaccine that it could, you know, have say 50% or 60% effectiveness. Um, but it also might make uh, COVID disease less uh, pathogenic, um, and so it so it would have you know. A lot of goods, but then we have to manufacture it. I was just about about to send a tweet uh, about this. Now, there's so many steps we have to manufacture it to scale. Um, most people don't realize that the, the vac most of the vaccines in clinical trials now are require two doses. So you have to get both doses. You've got to get uh, patients in for one dose and then have them come back for another dose. Um, then you need to, once you've manufactured it to scale, you're going to have to have cold storage because it's got to be in, you know, minus 50 degree uh, uh, temperature. Um, and then you have to have a, an infrastructure to be able to deliver the vaccine, particularly 
um, for those in rural areas or, or inner cities where they don't have good access to health services. Um, so there's a lot, lot of steps that we need to take, which is why I think most of us are thinking we're not going to have a major um, impact of a vaccine in the United States until um, mid-summer 2021. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the questions on that, uh, one of the students wrote, how do we manage the incentives to hoard uh, you know, uh, or profit from vaccines? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the companies have acted pretty well. You know, a lot of the companies have, you know, have said two things. One, you know, the chief executive officers of the major pharmaceutical companies recently, about a week ago, came out with a statement, you know, promising not to um, ask the FDA for approval of their vaccine until it finished phase three clinical trials. It's very sad that, you know, you have uh, the private sector that doesn't, particularly have a good reputation, having to, you know, feeling the need to do that when they're under political pressure to act more quickly. Um, so that's, you know, that, that's the first uh, thing. And then the next is, is you're going to have to get um, enough people to believe that it's safe um, and to actually, uh, you know, take the vaccine. Right now, um, they're, you know, something like, um, 30% of the American public would take the vaccine right away. The rest of them would wait because um, they're not sure. And that could be a big problem. If you want to get so-called herd immunity or community immunity, you need to get up a large thres threshold of our population being able to do that. So you've got a lot of steps to get through. So would you urge people to take the vaccine when it's... Yes, I would. I would. I mean, I did tweet once the saying that I'm, you know, I'd have, to, I'd have to think twice, you know, because I was really worried about the FDA at the time. Yes, I think I would get it. Um, you know, the, the only, the only, um, the only concern I have is, you know, you know, doing this post-market surveillance, you know, making sure. And so it's always, you know, if you wanted to be absolutely safe, it's always better to wait. But I, I think, given the urgency of this pandemic. Um, and given uh, the, the risk to your health and safety, yes, I would absolutely urge everyone to get it. So was it during the Ford administration? Was it the swine flu vaccine? It was, yeah. So what's, and that was disastrous. Yeah. Um, okay. You want to talk about that and what's changed? Yeah, I mean, you know, that was a vaccine that was um, you know, rushed through. Um, not as fast as we're doing this one, but, but basically Gerald Ford um, ran a mass uh, vaccination campaign um, for the entire population. Um, and that mass uh, campaign ended up causing uh, Epstein-Barr syndrome, a kind of chronic fatigue syndrome which hadn't really been noticed very much in uh, clinical trials, but once it started to roll out at scale, uh, it could see it. Um, so, so there was, you know, the National Academy of Sciences and Harvard did a study that kind of the, the, uh, the classic example of how, you know, a vaccine strategy can go wrong. And the presidential historians say that the singular reason that, uh, uh, President Ford was not reelected because of his swine flu vaccine campaign, um, which ended up disastrously. And we've seen it in other places. So, for example, um, uh, in the Philippines, this is the most recent example, there was a, um, a large rollout of the dengue vaccine, which is a you know, pretty effective vaccine. Um, but it turned out, and I won't get into the technical details, but it turned out that that for certain children who are getting the vaccine, if they had already had another strain of dengue, and there are several strains, about five strains of dengue, the vaccine caused the dengue fever to be much worse, mm. not better. And that's another worry that we have with the COVID vaccine. That's why you need to really be sure. Now, shifting from the vaccine to you know, masks and social distancing. Uh, we had several questions about forcing compliance with social distancing and masking. Um, 
Is aggressive enforcement of social and criminal liability an effective solution to force compliance with these important behaviors? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a dual question, um, if I can kind of tease it out. I mean, I had an article in JAMA, um, you know, calling for a national um, uh, vaccine mandate, but we were against the idea of the federal government um, imposing that mandate, but rather thought it would be more like um, uh, seat belts or, uh, or age 21 drinking age, um, where there's a famous Supreme Court case uh, uh, that where the Supreme Court said that you could, that what the federal government could do is, is uh, condition a certain amount of funding on states agreement to adopt a, a national standard, but there would be state rules. And so I think that that's a smart way to try to kind of have some kind of a, a national policy. But I, I've always been against the idea of very aggressive, punitive um, enforcement of, uh, of any public health measure. Um, and we actually recently, um, Bill, just we're talking about this at, in the public health advisory group for um, uh, Georgetown University and President DeJoya, um, you know, where basically the idea of shaming and blaming students um, for not, for violating Georgetown rules was not a good idea. But what we needed to do is to, you know, we have to get students to be part of the solution, you know, that make them all feel that they have a stake in it for themselves and their, and their fellow students. Um, so, I, so I don't like uh, these kinds of very aggressive measures. I never liked them with HIV or, or TB or any of those. I think it's you get a backlash. And so I prefer a soft, softer approach if possible. So how do you get people to wear masks? You know, if you're not going to have civil or criminal mandates or, you know, talking guys. Yeah. I mean, it start. you know, we have a problem in the United States because, you know, if you look at most of the countries around the world and certainly all those that have done well, um, masks are, you know, they're not, they're not a political symbol. They're not a symbol of freedom or anything like that. Um, they're just something that um, the public does. And the reason you, the way you, they work is because two things, one, the public you know, understands the importance of common goods, you know, and they're not always just about their own rights. Um, but the other is, is that there's been consistent, clear messaging um, by uh, public health authorities and by political leaders. If you look at Germany, um, uh, uh, Merkel has been, you know, absolutely clear about the importance of social distancing, masking, and things like that. She supported her science advisors. And, you know, so we've, you know, you know, we've done pretty much the opposite of everything that countries have done to bring this under control. We really do know how to do it. Um, but, but we've done pretty much the opposite. And one example is just simply the, you know, the, the erosion of uh, belief in science and particularly undermining our scientific agencies, you know, the CDC, um, state and local health departments, the US FDA, all of those things are, you know, really uh, damaging to our response. So, um, so you're, one of the themes of the course is the difference between rules and norms. And so what you're talking about here is really developing norms in which people have, and again, this goes back to your, one of the earlier topics about promoting a sense of common good. Yeah. So the, it's really about promulgating norms and, and also having government in, work to increase respect for scientific authority. Yeah, you know, one of the things in my career that I've done is that, you know, I've been very much involved in the ethics community um, and and worked on ethics when when President Clinton uh, was working on the healthcare reform task force. I was doing the ethics work there, and I um, I 
the, the whole idea of ethics originally was about biomedical ethics and really autonomy. Uh, and I kind of helped found the field called public health ethics, which kind of looks at the common good, you know, and that you know, some, so, so I don't have like a, um, you know, a, there, there isn't a clear dividing line about what, when you, when it's ethical to do one thing, when it's ethical to do another. I use this kind of, I use a formula that's very common sense, basically. It says, you know, how much of, how much are we asking you to do um, for the public? Um, so, you know, it matters to me, you know, if you're, if you're um, uh, putting somebody in, depriving them of their liberty um, or, you're, or you're making them lose their privacy so they lose their job, they're embarrassed. Those things matter a lot to me. But asking somebody to wear a mask is a very, very little thing to ask. And so the effect on autonomy is very low, but the benefit to the whole population is high. There's a, there's a, I used to do this in my class and I need a blackboard to really kind of do it properly, but the, there's, there's something called, um, Jeffrey Rose, a great British epidemiologist, had something that was called the prevention paradox. And the truth is, is that there are a lot of things, little things that public health asks you to do that truly, you know, we, we try to trick you into thinking you're doing it for yourself, but in fact, you're doing it for everyone. And so, you know, we say, you know, wear a seatbelt. The truth is, is if you go a very short distance, you know, wearing a seatbelt is very unlikely to matter. But on a population basis, it makes a huge difference. Same thing with a mask. Wearing a mask probably isn't going to stop you from getting COVID when you otherwise would or might help. Um, but if everyone wears a mask, um, we're all safer. Um, and so, you know, thinking about ethics in terms of, you know, how much am I asking you to do and how much good will it do if we all do it um, seems to be, you know, a good, you know, normative ethical rule um, that doesn't really, it's not dogma that says that civil liberties always win or that public health always wins. You really have to just think, you know, how much am I, how much of an intrusion is this? If it's a large one, I take it very, very seriously. If it's a small one, I don't. It's funny because when I do my scholarship, I sometimes ask people, you know, what do I get the most hate mail about? You know, and even death threats. And most people would say when I write on abortion or, or gun control, and I do get a lot of nasty um, mail and, and, and phone calls when that happens. But the most ever was when I argued uh, in favor of Michael Bloomberg's uh, soda portion rule. And so really people were only being asked, you know, to, to have a smaller portion of soda. And if they wanted to, a bigger portion, they just had to buy two. Is that really asking too much? And, you know, th so that's kind of how I think about, you know, the, the kind of I, I often say good science equals good ethics equals good law. And they have norms that, that, that go along with those three. So should jurisdictions have rules mandating wearing masks because it's that much of an incursion? Well, you know, the thing is, is that jurisdiction, to me, um, if you look at things that we need to get people to do, um, wear a seatbelt, wear a mask, get a vaccine, even a measles vaccine. And so for me, the very first question is, is how do we actually get the most people to do it? So I don't start with a mandate, um, but sometimes mandates actually empirically do work. So with, um, with uh, childhood diseases, we require every student to get a, the full complement of uh, vaccine preventable diseases um, before going into school or nursery um, or preschool. Um, that turns out that it's actually been very, very effective. And states like California that have actually um, gone full hog with their mandates, that is that they don't um, 
have any religious or philosophical exceptions have done well. So the question is really one more empirical. Um, if, if a mandate would actually help, um, I'm in favor of it. But if it's going to cause a backlash, um, will make uh, people feel more um, affronted, more, you know, feeling worse, then I would try other ways. And I would certainly start um, with a mass vaccine camp, uh, uh, vaccine education campaign and also control what's going on in social media. Right now, if you look at social media, most people don't know this, but there's a lot of conspiracy theories about the COVID-19 mm -hmm. uh, vaccine, that it's a CIA plot, um, that it's made of um, uh, uh, chimp brains, um, all kinds of things. And so that's partly responsible why we have such low um, uh, public approval for getting a vaccine. So one of the students wrote in and asks whether it would be ethical for an employer to require employees to take the vaccine. Yeah, I mean, I get that question a lot. Um, you know, it's complicated. I mean, on the on the one hand, in that JAMA article, we, we point out that the, there aren't any adult vaccine mandates in the United States. Um, but the only possible exception is, is that some states allow employers or businesses to require influenza vaccines of their, um, of their employees. Uh, hospitals, for example, and when they do that, they tend to get a higher um, uh, adherence rate um, and they do, when they do that. On the other hand, I'm about to have a study that's being published in The Lancet with a group of international researchers um, that actually looked at empirically at that very question, Bill. Um, and it turned out that um, if, that particularly among young people, um, if your employer requires it, um, there's more resistance to the vaccine. That's and so you have to be really careful about it. That's, it, that's fascinating. I, I sometimes suggest that the best way to do it for employers is what I called required offering. That is, the, the employer should be required by law to offer the vaccine to every employee um, and at no cost. And then uh, if the employee says no, they'd have to affirmatively sign a waiver. Um, most people won't do that. And so it's kind of what Cass Sunstein calls a nudge. You know, it's, you know, it's kind of pushing somebody gently in the right direction. That's, I mean, that's fascinating and important. Mm -hmm. uh, so actually, let me just, we got about 10 minutes left. So I want to loop back to what we started with, um, which are really kind of broader questions. Um, so, you know, a healthy mind and body. Yeah. So, um, you know, what does it mean to you to live a life full of vigor and contentment? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think you, know, you and others have asked me, you know, do I, do I, do I eat well and, and exercise and be physically active? Do I do it to live longer? And my answer is no, emphatically not no. E emphatically no. Uh, I do it to live better. You know, it's, you know, it's so much better to wake up in the morning um, and have a healthy you know, spring in your step because um, it'll make you smile. It'll make you, you know, uh, do your job a lot better. You'll be a lot more focused mentally. You'll, you'll feel better about yourself. Um, and so I think that, that you, you do it um, to make a better you. Um, um, but it does take work, you know, and, and I've often said, you know, you, you, you need to do three or four things and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. One is to eat well and don't believe all the things you read about how science doesn't know and it changes from day to day, you know, is butter or coconut, you know, uh, uh, oil good for you or bad for you. Know. The truth is, is that we do know a healthy diet, absolutely know a healthy diet. It's, it's plant-based, uh, it has um, healthy oils like uh, mono or polysaturated oil, but not, um, you know, things like butter or lard or animal fat. Um, you want to have lean protein um, and vegetables. You know, I, I am a little bit freaky. And, you know, so I actually, 
You know, some people count sheep at night um, when they go to bed. You know, I actually go back and then I think of what I ate during the day. And then I score myself on vegetables, fruit, protein, and anything bad I put in my body. And then I give myself an overall score. I very rarely get an A, I usually, but I sometimes get A minuses. Um, but it just kind of a, it, just thinking about those parts and then physical activity, um, aerobic exercise, as well as um, uh, strength training. Flexibility training is very important, yoga. And then um, things like Tai Chi, or things for your mind, like meditation. Um, I, I, I know it sounds really corny to a young student, but if you, got, if you just did 10 minutes a day of meditation, there's absolutely solid science that it does good for your physical and mental health. Um, and so it's just being conscious. And then, and I have to say this to all of our students, you know, you know if you think you're one of those that, doesn't need eight to nine hours sleep, you're deluding yourself. Yes, there are, there are one out of every 10,000 people that don't need it, but you do need it. And so sleep, you'll actually perform, you know, and, and the excuse that I don't have time to sleep is, is a non sequitur because, you know, if you don't sleep, you're going to be much less productive. So that's, you know, basically the, the formula in, in a short you know, a couple of sentences. Uh, that's a great formula. That's a great <laughs> formula. And you, uh, when you're talking about your day, so you, you're you very conscious of what you eat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and how long you sleep. Right. And I don't, but I don't deny myself things. You know, I just, I, I basically find nice workarounds, things that, you know, I like, I like a lot. I mean, I can get, I can give examples of it, but I, but basically, you know, I try not to put really, really unhealthy things in my body, but I'm, but there are ways to do things that are really, you know, make things taste really, really great. And so I don't deny myself and, 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 and I think deny, denying yourself what you, what you fancy and what you love is never, never a good strategy. And that's why I say never diet, you know, because diet just assumes that you're gonna use some, the latest fad or it's gonna be temporary. It's really just kind of a life choice, life decision, but you've got to do it in a way that you love it um, so that it's sustainable. Because if you don't love it, it's not going to be sustainable. So I'm going to ask you in a minute, the final question, which is how you serve your family and community. But before that, I do want to ask, give us any, two examples of workarounds that you've come up with. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, you know, if, if I'm, um, uh, if I, if I'm uh, hungry and I'm want you know there you know are chips or uh, candy or 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 uh, fast foods around. I'll actually just um, put some popcorn. Not you can't buy the popcorn in the um, you can't buy popcorn in the packet because they're really unhealthy. But just get plain popcorn. Put a little bit in the bottle of, bottom of a paper bag. Put it in the microwave for three minutes and a half or three, depending on how much. And then just, and so satisfying. And the other thing I do a lot is I drink a lot of tea um, and coffee because it kind of, it, it fills you up. Um, and then I eat a lot of, you know, a lot of fruit, a lot of, I, I eat a ton of carbs, things like that, because I just enjoy it and I find it very, very nice. Very good. So that's very good advice. So one final question before we, uh before we conclude. So how do you serve your family and community? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, a really, really important thing. You know, everybody serves their family and community according to, you know, what they do. So, um, you know, in their, that is in their own way. There isn't one set formula to do it. Um, I, you know, I do it in a, in a number of ways. Um, uh, I, first of all, I recognize my faults because there's a lot of things that um, I know I should do and I'm really, really bad at it. Um, so one the things that I kind of left out of, of the healthy list is probably the thing that is the most important, but I can't do it. Um, I'm not really social, you know, so being, you know, being a social animal, having 
you know, a knitting club, a book club, um, going to a class um, or, uh, or a church or a synagogue or a mosque. Those actually are quite good for your health. I never, ever done that. Um, but I make it in my own, my own contribution. I, I, I try to make sure that the people around me are living and eating well. I know that at Georgetown Law, you know, I, you know, with, with uh, uh, the people that work with me, I, I mentor them. And, you know, sometimes, you know, I'll come in and I'll ask them, you know, what have you had for breakfast? And they, they hide their donuts under the table. <laughs> but I talk to them about their, their problems. I, I, I like to, you know, mentor and, and nurture students. Um, I love my family and I, and I, I tell them how proud I have, I am of them all the time. Um, so I just try to do it in little ways. And then in my bigger ways, I try to, you know, fight for, for health and justice, which I think are, you know, two of the values that mean most to me. And so that's, so I, so I fight for that in many, many different realms. Well, that what inspiring thoughts to conclude and, and really, you know, thank you for all you've done in your career. So uh, we're about at the hour. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who made this possible. Uh, so Jake Eigner, Jessica Kelly, fabulous work in preparing for this class. Kelsey Levin Epstein, you know, really terrific help in organizing. Jonathan and Kyle from our AV team came in on the weekend, Dean Sale. Thank you for thinking about this course and helping us put this together. And Professor Gostin, you, I admire you so much. You're such an inspiration. And it was great to be able to spend an hour and a half listening and talking to you about the pandemic and what it means to lead a good life and how to lead. So, so thank you very much. And thank you everyone for being part of this class. So at this challenging time, thank you for joining us. Stay well, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. But again, a big round of applause, even though we're on webinar for <laughs> Professor Gostin. I'll just, I'll just wave. <laughs> Thank you. It's such a pleasure and privilege and joy to do this, Bill. I, I, I just, I can't tell you how much I admire you and, and the Georgetown Law community. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Professor Gostin. Thank you all, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Take care. Bye.